Uh, before I prepare my message, what I normally do is I pray and ask God, can you give me a message that you want me to share with the church? And this time was no exception. I did that. But God is so good to me because he, through this message, ministered to me. I learned so many things from this message. I realize it's a message that is tailored for me. Our problem with forgiveness. Okay, I want you to think about this seriously. And think about incidents in your life where you have been offended. Has someone said something to you that hurt you? Has someone done something that hurt you? Maybe you didn't get treated the way you should. Maybe that person ignored you. Maybe that person abused the trust. Maybe that person betrayed you. Maybe that person even attacked you. And uh, as humans, we have this way of reacting to problems. We always uh, get angry and we get shocked, you know, especially if it's a close member of your family or in your unit of friends. We always say, how can? How can this person do this? How can that person do that? After all I've done, if it's a stranger, it's not so bad. You know, we can dismiss it easily. But a close family member, a friend, a colleague, you know, a childhood friend, it, it bothers you. It stays with you for a long time. And after that, what do we do? We either confront that person or we think about it, we consider it from different angles. Sometimes we analyze it too much. Then we do the talking. We go around talking about it, we talk to our friends, talk to ourselves, talk to God. And this is the cycle. It keeps on going on and on. And the only thing more impressive than the ability to repeat ourselves is the memory we have for these incidents. We can remember every detail. We can remember what the person said, what the person did. These are 10 years ago, 15 years ago. We can still remember oh, the person was wearing this. The smell in the air was like this. So this is how we react to it. But I wanted to find out how or what the Bible asks of us. How should we react in these kind of situations? And I think you all know this better than me. The Bible tells you to forgive. Forgive, let it go, you know, let it be. It's everywhere. And later I'll go through the verses. And uh, there's a verse, what's it? You know, you turn the other cheek. Have you heard that verse? I like that verse because it's so dramatic. It's so much drama, right? Someone slaps you, then you turn the other cheek. You know, it's probably not going to know what to do. So, uh, I'll tell you a story. When I was younger, my brother and I got into a fight. You know, a heated argument. And he slapped me. And I remember this verse. So I said, slap la, the other cheek, slap la. And he slapped the other cheek. <laughs> I was like, what? I was so confused because I didn't expect that. <laughs> it didn't go according to plan. <laughs> but you get the point. The Bible keeps on telling us to forgive. But I've got an issue with this because, you know, forgiveness is a personal thing. It's not a relational thing. Right? Am I killing anybody? Am I stealing from anybody? Am I hurting anybody? I'm not. It's just a position I'm taking with regards to my personal life. And on top of that, it's not like I'm doing something wrong. Like if you kill someone, you steal, you hurt, that's the wrong thing you're doing. Here, you could say you're the victim. So why is it such a big deal? Why is it almost the same as every other sin? Unforgiveness. So I did a bit of reading, and I'm glad to tell you I got three reasons. Uh, three reasons to forgive. Okay, the first reason is you forgive for God. Why do you forgive for God? Well, I've got a couple of verses. Ephesians 4, uh, verses 31 to 32. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Okay, that's the first one. Second, Colossians 3, verse 13. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, 
If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. And last one, Matthew 5, verses 23 to 24. Therefore, if you bring a gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go on your way. First be reconciled with your brother, and then come and offer your gift. So these three verses make it very clear that God is not giving his opinion or making a suggestion, asking you to consider something. It's almost a commandment. God is telling you to do this. It's the same as the Ten Commandments, you know, you could argue. And the strange thing is, is that it's actually an act of obedience. And that's why the verse in Matthew makes so much sense. Because what do you do? You leave your sacrifice and you go back and do what God has asked you to do. Settle this issue and then you come back to your sacrifice. And that falls in line with what's said in Samuel. That obedience is better than sacrifice. So it is clear that God wants us to forgive. But, and when I say forgive, I mean obey. But the problem with us humans is uh, we're not so good with this obedience thing. I mean, if you look at the very first sin, what was that? That was disobedience. Adam and Eve, God told them, don't do this. Only thing you, don't, you can't do is this. And they went and did it. They, could, they couldn't have disobeyed in any other regard. Right? So we have this problem. So I think we need more convincing. It leads me to my second reason. The second reason is you forgive for people. Now this is a bit of an interesting one because what I realize is forgiveness has a power to inspire and encourage other people. We are called to be the light and salt of the world. We're called to make a difference, a positive impact, right? And the best example I have of this is what Jesus did. You see, they took Jesus, they whipped him, they beat him, they dragged him, they put a cross on him, then they nailed him to the cross, then they were gambling over his clothes. And what did Jesus say? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Now I read this verse, the word that comes to my mind is extra. Jesus is always extra, you know. We are struggling with small offenses. We can't forgive small offenses. Jesus is forgiven the enemies who are like presently beating him. And then he goes and advocates on behalf of the enemies. Tells God, forgive them. And then what happened? He left behind disciples, right? And all those disciples did supernatural things. They traveled the world. They shared the gospel. They were resilient to persecution. They weren't afraid of dying. In fact, most of them were martyred. Peter, he was crucified upside down because he said, I'm not worthy to die the same way Jesus died. Upside down, and I found out in an X shape, X shape crucifixion, you've got to have some guts to do that. And I think James was beheaded. And Stephen, he was stoned to death. But you know what he said when he was about to die? He said, Lord, do not hold this against them. Now, where do you think he got that from? Why do you think he said it? I think that he knew there will come a day where I might have to die for the gospel. And I want to do what Jesus did. But <laughs> we encounter another problem with human beings, is that we're not so selfless. You know, when you think about other people, uh, they're in your extra time. You know, we, take, we tend to protect our own interests. You know, I th the story of Nelson Mandela is a good, good one. He spent 27 years in prison, but he impacted the world. He impacted South Africa. The ripple effect of what he has done, you can't measure it. But I ask you, would you be willing to go to prison for 27 years to impact the world? Uh, I'm, 27 years is like my whole life. It's a long time. So, again, we need more convincing. That leads, it, that leads to my third reason, for yourself. Now, if you're a Christian, there are two aspects to this. The first 
is God's position on unforgiveness. Okay? Vis-a-vis -vis you. So this is what God has said. Okay? Luke, judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Then he says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. And the last one's from Mark. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. So I'm just going to leave it there because it's quite clear that it's no joke for God. I don't think he's talking about salvation because that's by faith. But I think he's talking about everything else in between. So you've got your time on earth. How do you want God to react to you while you're on earth? I think it's relevant for what you have in store in heaven. So that's what God has said. For your own sake now, you've got to protect yourself. You know, forgive. And the second reason to forgive is that unforgiveness is like poison. Now, I'm not being spiritual here. This is actually science now. Okay? Unforgiveness is now a disease. And I was doubtful whether that was true, so I did a bit of research. And I found this. Okay, this is from Johns Hopkins um, Medicine. John Hopkins, they have a university, they have a hospital. It's an 8 billion integrated global enterprise dealing with healthcare. They are not Christian based. This is complete science. And what does it say there? Conflict doesn't just weigh down the spirit, it can lead to physical health issues. But these steps from John Hopkins experts can help you to move towards forgiveness and better health. So they've got treatment for unforgiveness. Isn't it strange how now science is catching up to what God has already said? And this is the enterprise they have. It's huge. Plenty of research goes into their work. Now, I'd just like to read this, exp this uh, portion. Okay, it says here, the fourth paragraph, huh? of all cancer patients, 61% have forgiveness issues. And of those, more than half are severe. According to research by Dr. Michael Barry, a pastor and the author of the book, Unforgiveness Project. Harboring these negative emotions, this anger, hatred, creates a state of chronic anxiety. Chronic anxiety very predictably produces excess adrenaline and cortisol, which depletes the production of natural uh, cell killers, which is your body's foot soldiers in the fight against cancer. Now, I think we have to check ourselves on two counts. The first is, do you have any medical problems? Do you have any ailments? And the second is, if you do, do you have any forgiveness issues? Do you have unforgiveness in your heart? Now, if you answered yes to both counts, then I think there's some things you've got to do. But sometimes we say, yes, we have medical problems, but I have no issue with unforgiveness. I've forgiven everybody. I'm cool. But it's important to get the right definition of forgiveness. Is forgiveness going to your room and saying, God, I forgive, I forgive that person? Or is it going to that person and saying, I forgive you? Or is it saying, God, uh, I forgive and I leave it to you? Or is it forgiving and forgetting? Or is it forgiving and going back to the relationship you had? There's a verse in the Bible, I mean, the standard the Bible, the gold standard in the Bible is forgive from your heart. Now, what does from your heart mean? I really don't know. But if you look at Jesus, he's forgiving his enemies. That's one. And you look at the Bible, you look at the Christian story, what is it about? It's about reconciliation and God giving us an opportunity to be forgiven. So if you ask me, I think we're leaning towards the forgive, forget and be friends kind of situation. And talking about standards and God's standards, have you ever realized that the Bible keeps on telling you to do things that are so difficult? Well, let's consider a few. First, you've got to forgive your enemies. Then you've got to love your enemies. Then you've got to be willing to sacrifice. Then you've got to be a servant and then be a leader. 
And then after that, you've got to love your God more than your family. And you've got to tithe. These are very difficult things, you know. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, God, it would be nice if there's somewhere in the Bible it said, you know, thou shall have banana leaf rice every week. Or thou shall have ice cream every week. Yeah, it's so easy to do, you know. Or if someone annoys you, just knock them on the head twice. You know, we're knocking everyone's head. And if they get angry, you say, it's biblical, it's the Bible. But, jokes aside, you see that it is important. And I note that some people can do it really well. Some people find it easy to forgive. So I know there's a secret there. So I wanted to find out what the secret was. Something is either helping them forgive, or there must be some hindrance that they've overcome to forgive. And the first thing I, I realize is that a lot of the times, that when we encounter these situations, we have the wrong perspective on what is happening. You see, I don't think we really appreciate how much God loves us. I don't think we understand that God has allowed this thing to happen. Because if you know that I am God's son, that God only has good plans for me, and He's allowed this, then th- your reaction will be different. You'll be saying, there's a lesson to be learned, or... There's, this is a benefit, I'm not seeing it right. And Joseph had that. You know, when he became the second in command in Egypt, and his brothers came and said, oh, sorry, I really didn't mean to. And he said, don't worry, guys. You know, you guys meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Joseph knew that everything bad that happened to him was an opportunity for him to get closer to where God wanted him to be. And I think that if we all adopt Joseph's mentality, we will look at life and we won't say, oh, life is happening to me. We'll say, life is happening for me. It's for my benefit. And the second and more interesting one is that pride gets in the way. Pride gets in the way of forgiveness. Now, why do I say, I've got a story for you, actually. Um, Some time ago, something happened. It got me really upset. I was worked up. I couldn't believe it happened, and I was angry. And I felt it was unjust and unfair. Okay? So I would go on my daily life, and then suddenly I would see something about forgiveness here, there, everywhere. And it's just annoying because you don't want to see any of that at the moment, you know? You just want to be angry. So I asked God, I said, God, I know you're telling me to forgive, but, you know, it's not easy. This thing is not easy, okay? And I am the one who suffers. I've been wrong, and I'm suffering. Okay, that person is not, he's chilling. That person has no problem. I don't see other people going through this, you know. So what you're asking of me is not easy. And I felt God respond this way, and I'm so cautious about saying this because I know it sounds so weird. It's, I'm not ignorant, I know it's going to sound weird. Um, but I felt God say this to me. Uh, okay, yeah, what he said? He said, um, don't you want legend status? And I was like, what? what? This sounds like me. It's my language. I speak like this. But I understood what he meant. He says, you can't boast or be happy about small things you do in life. Small things you overcome, what's that? If you want to say you achieve something, achieve big things, something significant. I said, fine. Okay, so I will forgive. Yeah, but you know, it just happened. It just happened to me. Give me some time. You know? Have some mercy on me. <laughs> and the next response I got was basically God reminding me of a story where a man, something bad happened to this man and re- he reacted really well. He reacted immediately and did the right thing. So uh, I said, okay, God, I will forgive and I'll do it soon. You know, I'll do it soon. But you know what, God? You say you're a just God. You say you're a God of justice. Where's my justice in all of this? You know, I want my revenge. Where's my revenge? So I told God. And this is the scary part. Because God said that not everyone has had their revenge on you. And then he finished by saying, but that can be arranged. And I was like, what? <laughs> this is blackmail. <laughs> this is called blackmail. But I tell you, I listen. I listen fast, man. Because I know I've done so many wrong things in my life. I know that I've sinned in so many areas. So what I'm saying is this, that if you have this opportunity or privilege to forgive someone, 
it's clear that they have wronged you. It's clear that it's unjust and unfair. And what we like to do is we like to paint this picture that we are this innocent, pure, helpless uh, angel of a victim. And because of that, it's so much worse. How can this happen to this person? Didn't do anything wrong in his life. Didn't hurt a fly. And we are just sneaky. Just sneaky because we all know we are sinners. We all know we fall short. We all know we've made mistakes. But what we do is we will qualify everything we did wrong and amplify what they did wrong and then justify it in our head that we are okay. But if we have the right perspective, consider our flaws, then it'll be easier to forgive. If a brother offends me, I say, okay, bro, we're the same, only me and you, we're the same. And so sometimes it's good to recognize your flaws and remember your flaws. And I'm not saying that, uh, I'm not saying condemn yourself and then get depressed, not at all. I'm just saying that bear it in mind so it can encourage you to do the right thing, what God wants you to do. And the funny thing about uh, <laughs> preparing this message is God led me to a, a Bible verse, and you've all heard it before. It's a story or a parable about the unforgiving servant. Okay? So Peter goes up to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Seven times? I think we all can relate to Peter. There are some people in our lives just... Again and again and again, they do the wrong thing. Again and again and again, they offend. They're just continual and repetitive. So I think Peter's asking, is there an exception to this general rule? Okay, if he does it too many times, can I just take him out? And Jesus, his response is good. You know, he says, 70 times 7, which is a lot of times. And then he goes straight into this parable. What is this parable about? I think you all know. He says, the kingdom of God is like a king who wants to settle accounts with his servant. So first thing to note is that we're dealing with kingdom principles. I think that if we are compared to the world standard, we are like excellent. We pass, we pass with flying colors. But kingdom standard is much higher. So he says, this king calls up this servant and he, this servant owes the king 10,000 talents. Now, a talent, I found out, is a unit of measurement. It's used to measure gold, right? And it's about 35 kilograms. One talent, 35 kilograms. And if you want to use the price of gold today, that would amount to about 1.25 million USD. One talent. So this servant owed the king 12.5 billion USD. And king says, all right, you can't pay. Sell you. I'm going to sell your wife. I'm going to sell all your children and all your possessions in payment of the debt. I don't think it would have made a dent in the debt, but that's what the king said. And this servant gets down on his knees and he prays, king, please, please, give me more time. Worship the king, give me more time. I don't know what this guy is smoking, but you know, time is not going to help when you're dealing with 12.5 billion but he still asks. And the amazing thing, how the king responds, the king does not give him, the servant, what the servant asked. He just asks for time. The king says, don't worry, I'm moved by compassion. Your debt is wiped clean. So that would have been a nice story, right, if it ended there. But no, the servant goes back out. He sees a fellow servant, grabs him by the neck, and he says, pay me the hundred denarii that you owe me. Now, denarii, let me give you a bit of a comparison. Okay, one talent, 6,000 denarii. Okay, he owes 100 denarii. So 12.5 billion, 20,000. That's the comparison. 20,000 is 0.00016% of 12.5 billion. And this second servant does the same thing. He goes and says, please give me more time. And I think he's more realistic. I think you can settle 20,000. But this first servant says no and sends him to prison. So the king finds out, the king finds out, and the king calls up the servant, he's really angry, and he, what he says is, you wicked, you wicked servant, I forgave you of your debt. Shouldn't you have shown compassion to this person? And what does the king do? And this is the part I want to focus on. 
This is the verse. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. And Jesus ends off this parable. He's so chill. He says, so my heavenly father will also do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. The end. I don't think Peter ever asked a question about forgiveness anymore. <laughs> so I just want to close by saying this, that God has forgiven us of a huge debt. That things that we don't deserve, we get. Things that we actually deserve, we don't get. He keeps at bay. And He has asked that we forgive. And it's a small thing. And we know even it benefits us. So it's not hard to show some mercy. And uh, what does God require of us? Remember in Micah it says, to act justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly before God. And I hope you've been blessed. You know, um, as I was preparing this message, uh, I was a- when I was asked to share, actually, I thought, you know, what, what do I share about? And I'd been doing some thinking and praying and uh, uh, research, and I thought, oh, that's easy. I'll just share, you know, my own kind of thoughts on what I've been thinking, and praying, and, you know, what God had led me to. And so that's what I started wanting to share about. And indeed, that's what I, I will be uh, sharing about. But as I was preparing, um, about three weeks, a month ago, you know, when, when the guy from England came and he was talking about trafficking of uh, people and, you know, all the horrors that are going on in the world, Randomly, I was just sat at the back and just randomly this thought came into my mind. The title of your topic is Don't Look Back. What? You know, it wasn't even anything he was talking about. So I put it to the back of my mind and continued listening. But I went back and I thought about it and I prayed about it. And I, and I said to God, well, okay, th- it must be God's message because it wasn't anything that I had been thinking about in terms of a title. Um, but okay, it's a don't look back. But as I prepared, um, the entire topic kind of like took a curveball, you know? It went in a circle and it's come back to the beginning. So uh, let us pray. Lord, may the words I speak be those that you want spoken. May the words we hear be those that you want us to hear. And may we be led to live to thy glory. Amen. So. Don't look back. Can I ask, I'm presuming, I mean, I see that there are a lot of familiar faces here, so I'm presuming all of you are Christians, but has everyone actually made that step of accepting Jesus as your personal savior? Have we all done that? Because if you haven't, I would like to urge you, now is the time. Now is the time that you must come forward and accept Christ and live your life in accordance with his will for you. If you haven't, speak to Pastor Jerry later. Or if you don't want to speak to him, speak to one of the elders. Or if you don't want to speak to them, speak to someone who is involved in a church somewhere else. But you must accept Christ because it is a matter of life and death. If you are a Christian, if you have accepted Christ, do you know who you are? Pastor Jerry, when he was doing um, uh, communion and, and kind of like uh, explaining and praying, you know, um, when, he off when we were going to take the bread and wine, explained to us who we were. He uttered certain words. But do you really believe them? Do you really accept who you are? Can I ask all of us to read these verses from the Bible? Because this is who you are, and this is who you must live your life out to be. So let's read it together. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For our sake, He made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 
and finally, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. That is what you are when you accepted Christ. You became a new creation. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. Do you believe this? Do you live your life as a new creation, not clinging to the sins of the past? And if you're a new creation, do you believe that Jesus was punished once and for all for your sin? You are therefore no longer a sinner. Because as Paul said in Romans, for the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin that dwells in me. You have, may have a sin habit, but you are no longer a sinner. Do you believe that? Do you live your life in that manner, believing it? That I no longer am a sinner because Christ died once and all for my sins. God does not see me as a sinner. I am pure. I am his righteousness. There is no spot on my robes. But I may have a sin habit. I may like alcohol a little too much. I may have a heart of unforgiveness. But that is something the Holy Spirit is taking care of when we accept Christ. Is it not? And therefore, if you recognize the new person that you are in Christ Jesus, you must, you must act accordingly. You must look forward to the person that God has called you out to be. And you need to stop looking back to your sins of the past. You need to stop looking back to the person that you were and look forward to how God sees you. When you stand in front of the mirror in the morning, brushing your teeth and combing your hair, what do you see? Do you see a useless person? I didn't get, you know, I didn't go to university. I'm useless. I'm worthless. Do you see someone who is bitter and angry? Do you see someone who is gluttonous, an alcoholic, a drug addict? Or do you see who God sees you as, his righteousness, the new creation that he sees you as being? And if you see yourself in the right way, if you see yourself in the way God sees you, you will be acting very differently. You know, I have a friend who is um, related to the Negri uh, royal family, so he's a prince actually. And, you know, everyone says that when he walks and, and the way he carries himself, you don't need to know who he is. He carries himself like a prince, like someone who's entitled. We are part of the heavenly kingdom. We are part of that royal household. King of kings and lord of lords. That is who you are. You're a co-heir. Do you carry yourself in the same way as a prince or a princess? Or do you carry yourself like a tramp? Like a sinner? Like a worthless person? God has called you out. And he's asked us to sit and reign with him. And therefore we must start acting and behaving like royalty. You need to hold your head up high and know who you are. I am a child of God. Little children, you are of God. That's what the verse said earlier that you read. Little children, you are of God. So let us not look back to the past, but let us cling firmly and look firmly ahead to the person that God has told us we are. Please read with me. Um, I'm going to be reading from Luke 17, and, and this is where, like I said, my message kind of like took a turn of its own. Um, I had not viewed this passage in the way that I viewed it um, now when I've read it in the past. And this is now Jesus um, talking to the Pharisees and then to his disciples. And um, he was asked by the Pharisees, we read, now when he, Jesus, was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. 
the kingdom of God is within you. Then he said to the disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built, but on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. Remember Lot's wife. It surprises me that of all the amazing people in the Bible, you know, you've got people like Abraham and King David, of all the amazing women in the Bible, the heroine Queen Esther, the devoted Ruth, the Virgin Mary, the pure Mary, mother of Jesus. Mary, who sat at Jesus' feet. I'm sure she so loved him. She sat at his feet. She poured, she broke the very expensive alabaster of oil and poured it upon him. Of all the people in the Bible, who does Jesus ask us to remember? The faceless, unnamed Lot's wife. We know very little about her. We only know that his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. That's all we know about Lot's wife, nothing else. Why did Jesus ask us to remember her? Remember Lot's wife. Let us look at the time and context that Jesus spoke and to whom he was speaking. He was talking about his coming. He was talking about his second coming. And it amazes me that last year when I was speaking here, unbeknown to me, I'd spoken about Jesus coming with the you know, uh, parable of the 10 virgins. And once again, I find myself speaking about Jesus' coming. It is not by accident, and it's certainly not my plan. Jesus had just finished talking to the Pharisees about the coming of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is already within us. But then, he continues and he speaks to his disciples. And he says, many people will tell you that, the, that uh, Jesus has come again. The second coming has already happened. And indeed, we have a lot of religions in this world where their leaders proclaim to be the Christ, you know, the second coming of Christ. The Baha'is with Baha'u'llah, uh, the people of the Am Ahmadis, uh, their leader says he's the second coming uh, or Christ come again. But Jesus warns his disciples, don't believe any of them. For when Christ comes again, the entire world will know. As the lightning flashes from one part of the heavens to the other part of the heavens, across the whole earth, you will know when Jesus comes. So let us not be deceived by anyone else, Jim Jones or whoever, David Koresh. But still speaking about his second coming, Jesus warns his disciples, remember Lot's wife. And if Jesus has warned his disciples, the people closest to him, his 12 disciples, if he wants them to remember Lot's wife, I think it's really important for us to ask ourselves, what about her does he want us to remember? Why has he said, remember Lot's wife? What do we know about Lot's wife? Well, one thing is certain, uh, I was doing a little bit of research and I found that um, there are two historians, uh, Josephus, 
who is a very, very well-renowned um, historian and who, upon whose writing a lot of the excavations in Israel um, have been followed. You know, they, they read him and then they go and excavate and they find that actually what he's written about is true. Um, he was uh, very much around um, just after Jesus. And he said, but Lot's wife continually turning back to view the city as she went from it and being too nicely inquisitive what would become of it, although God had forbidden her to so to do, was changed into a pillar of salt, for I have seen it, and it remains this day. So according to Josephus, Lot's story and Lot's wife was not just figment of Jesus' imagination. Uh, he says he could see her. And Clement of Rome. Now Clement of Rome was perhaps one of the first popes of the Catholic Church, and um, it is said that he was actually taught by the Apostle Peter. So can you imagine that instead of Pastor Jerry here, you have Peter teaching you, okay? That was the experience Clement of Rome had. And he said that he, um, during his time, uh, Lot's wife could be seen and that her members were still recognizable. So, you know, it is very clear that Lot's wife is very, very real and a true story. So if Jesus has warned his disciples to remember Lot's wife, let us see what we know about her. Um, so we go to the story of Lot and his wife, and I've just summarized it very quickly, but please go back and read it for yourself. Um, one thing is certain, when the angels came to Sodom, Lot was found at the city gate, and Lot met them, and he invited them into his home. Now, although Lot had been set apart, he was part of that group that Abraham left Haram with, which means that like Abraham, Lot had been set apart. But here we find Lot at the city gates, which means, and, and um, inviting the visitors into his home, which means that from having been set apart, he is now, he and his family have now become a part of Sodom. They've moved into Sodom. And, um, but yet he insists that the angels stay at his house but they say, no, 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 it's okay, we're going to stay at the, uh, within the city. And he's like, no, please don't, and he insists. So they go home, he feasts them, that's what Genesis 19 says. He gives them a feast, they bake unleavened bread. And just before they're retiring for the night, his home is surrounded by the men of Sodom. And they're banging on the door, and they're trying to get in, and they're calling to Lot, give us the men, those visitors, send them out, because we want to have our way with them. So Lot stepped out and he said, no, 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 please don't. These men have sought refuge in my home. I am their protector. But look, I have two unmarried daughters, Lot says. Let me give them to you and you do what you want with them. The thing that I'm a little bit confused about Lot is that Paul describes Lot, and, and I put it up in 2 Peter. Sorry, Peter describes Lot in 2 Peter. Um, he describes him as righteous. I'm not quite sure what kind of righteous man is giving his two unmarried daughters to these the mob of Sodom. But nevertheless, that's what happens. Um, he offers them the daughters. But these men don't want any of that. They want the visitors. And so they say to Lot, who are you that you judge us? And Lot says, please, you know, take this. And he, they then say, we will do worse to you. What we were going to do, do to those men, we are going to do worse to you. And so the angels yanked, opened the door and yanked Lot in, into the house. They saved his life. And they blinded the men. And the surprising thing is that um, in the Bible it says that even blinded, these men continued to look for a way in. That is how depraved the people of Sodom were. I can assure you, if I was blinded right now, there will be no message. You'll be taking me to the hospital. <laughs> Right? And if someone out here was blinded, there'll be a little commotion and I may still have to stop the message. But these men were so depraved that even though they were blinded, they were still looking for a way in. They were still trying to get their hands on the visitors. So after that, after the men were blinded and they couldn't find their way, way in, and the Bible says that they go weary, they go, grew tired, the visitors then warned Lot about the destruction that was going to befall Sodom. And they told him to take his whole family, including his sons and sons-in-law, and leave. 
But in the Bible, it says, Lot lingered. He tarried. He delayed. He, he took his time. You know when King David got into trouble? He got into trouble when he was supposed to go to battle. But what did he do? He sent his army ahead of him, but he delayed. He tarried. He went up to the roof of his palace, and from there, he spotted a woman. And that was his downfall. He ended up marrying her and killing her husband. When we delay in following what God wants us to do, we get into trouble. Lot tarried. And so early the next morning, the angel said, come on, you can't delay any longer. And he, the angels, the Bible says, the angels took Lot and his wife and the two daughters and made them leave. They took them out of Sodom. They took them out of the city walls. And they made them flee. And they were told to go to the mountains, go as far away from Sodom as they could get. Go to the mountains. When Abraham, oh sorry, when Abraham and Lot had that, well, their people, their herdsmen, had a disagreement. And Abraham said in Genesis 18, and Abraham said to Lot, you choose. We can't live like this any longer. Our guys are fighting over the water for our sheep. You choose. Where do you want to go? Lot looked around. He saw the mountains, which would have made a very good place to build an altar to the Lord and to worship God and to learn to live by faith. And then he looked down to the plains. And Sodom is near Canaan, or it's within that area of Canaan. So um, these people are the children of Ham, um, from Noah's son, Ham. And it was a luscious place. It was a beautiful place. And he saw that there was trade going on. There was commerce going on. And he, Lot thought, ah, yeah, the mountains are a little bit too difficult. I will go and pitch my tent near Sodom. The Bible describes, says that Lot, pitched his tent towards Sodom. He did not go straight into Sodom. He pitched his tent outside but facing Sodom so that he could benefit from Sodom. And um, he went into the plains. He wanted the easy, more comfortable life. But now, the angels have said, go to the mountains, flee as far as you can from Sodom. And they were warned, do not look back. But Lot being the weaker kind of person that he is and seeking creature comfort said, the mountains and the hills are too far for me and my family. Look, look, there's this other city nearby, Zoar. Can we go there? And so the angel said, okay, but hurry up and get there because until you get into safety, until you get into Zoar, we cannot do anything. That was God's mercy for uh, Lot and his family. They, Lot, God was not going to rain destruction upon Sodom as long as Lot and his wife and his family were nearby. So he had to get into Zoar. And the Bible says, the sun was risen on the earth. It was a beautiful day. But Lot's wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Why did Lot's wife look back? I would like to suggest that the reason why Lot's wife looked back is the same reason why we all look back. Why we all cannot see ourselves as the righteousness of God. Why, why we keep living in our Sodom. We keep going back to the sins of the past. We keep thinking about the person that we were. I think it's the same reason why she looked back. And so this perhaps is a warning and yet an encouragement for us all that it's high time, the time is now, that we need to move forward to the hills from whence our help comes, as the psalmist says, and not to look back to the past. My suggestion as to why she looked back, Lot's wife did not have a biblical worldview. Her worldview was that of Sodom. Her views and her ideas of right and wrong was linked to what Sodom and the people of Sodom thought was right and wrong. And indeed, much later in Genesis, we read about, in, in, uh, late in, in Genesis 19, we read about how the daughters lay with their father. And we know that um, Sodom was a cesspool of, of sex and all sorts of depravity. And what daughter would lay with the father but one that has that kind of worldview? 
ingrained within them or, or within their hearts. So she did not have a biblical worldview. World view. We know, like I was saying earlier, that Lot and family were separated from Adam and they went to live in the uh, plains of, um, of Canaan. They were found at the city gates. But this study that I did shows that many, many Christians also have a different worldview. Many, many Christians do not have a biblical world worldview, just like Sodom's wife. And it's shocking that less than one in five practicing Christians have a complete biblical worldview. This means more than four-fifths. That means if you have 10 people, only one or one and a half will have a completely, truly biblical worldview. Only one or one and a half will know what is right and wrong according to God's law, according to kingdom principles. That was the word Joshua used just now, kingdom principles. Most of us, most Christians, most people who say and profess to be Christians actually have a different worldview. They agree with ideas rooted in new spirituality. 54% with post-modernism. Shockingly, 38% agree with Islam and Islamic principles. 36% with Marxism and 29% with secularism. The problem with pitching our tent towards Sodom is that very, very slowly, Sodom comes to live within us. And we go and live within Sodom. And we get caught up, you know, and, and mixed up with the worldview that Sodom has. My friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, we are sanctified people. We, like Abraham and like Lot, have been set apart by God. We must know what the biblical worldview is and we must abide by it. Because if we don't, you know, there is no uh, straddling the world and loving God. It's one or the other. Because like Lot's wife, very slowly Sodom will take over. And our heart will be in Sodom. In Isaiah, he describes a faithful city which became a harlot. Silver became dross. Dross is that thing, you know, um, when you purify gold, gold and silver are always mixed, they're always impure when you first get them. And then they have to be purified. You know, we, the Bible talks about the purification of gold. And what is left behind, the impurities, is dross. So silver, the pure silver, pure metal, has now become useless, impure metal. Because thy wine you have mixed with water. Once you have mixed wine with water, how do we get the water out of the wine? Impossible. I also don't think that she gave her life to God. She lived with a sanctified man. Lot was righteous, like I said. She had seen the blessings and benefits of being sanctified. Abraham, although he was brought out of his father's home and he went to live in the mountains, and, and for a while he was nomadic, and then he went to live in the mountains, we know from the Bible he grew prosperous. Not only Abraham, but those who went out with him. So we know Lot became prosperous. That's why Abraham and Lot's men were fighting for water. Your sheep and my sheep, not enough water, not enough wells. Both became prosperous. So Lot's wife had benefited from all this. She was married to a righteous man. And yet, she preferred to be part of the general populace. She refused to live a sanctified life. She refused to give her life to God. And this is why I say the right time and opportunity to commit and to turn our lives around is now. There's never going to be a better time or a better opportunity. Satan is always going to get in the way. You say you're going to get up early and go to church. Don't worry. The alarm clock won't ring. If it does ring and you get ready, the phone will, someone will call you and you can't get out of the house. And when you finally get out of the house, you start your car, the battery has died. There will be something to stop you from getting to church on time. There will be something that will stop you from uh, giving your life wholly to God. I'm going to wait until I meet the right person. 
I'm going to marry a good, a godly person, a godly spouse, and then I will do prayer time and all that in my house, and we will live a godly life. No, that will never happen. I'm going to make a little bit of money because now I have to work really hard, so I can't give up my Sabbaths. I need to make my money, and then I will give up the Sabbath, and then I will dedicate my life to God. That will never happen because you'll never have enough money. So, we have to make time. We have to make that decision, and the decision is now. We have to decide to forsake the world and to turn back to God. And that is why it is so important for us to be part of a church, to be part of the body of Christ, because then we encourage each other. It's very, very hard to walk this road alone. As uh, Joshua said, it's very, very hard to do what God wants us to do. But that is why we need people to keep reminding us. Just the other day, two days ago, I think it was, or yesterday, I read a story about two sisters, and, and um, one sister had actually written. Um, they were both, their family had been taken in by the Nazis. Fr they were Jews in Hungary. They'd been taken in by the Nazis, and um, they were sent to Auschwitz, the concentration camp. And uh, right at the very start, both the parents were, uh, uh, lives were taken by the Nazis. And um, there were two sisters left. And um, just as the Americans and Russians were coming in to free Germany um, and to free the, the prisoners of Auschwitz and other concentration camps, um, the Nazis made them walk, get, got them out of Auschwitz, and they had to walk for miles, 30 miles, you know, not having enough food, some days no food at all. She writes, she, uh, she describes the ditches were full of, were running, were rivers of blood of the people ahead of them who had stumbled, who had fallen, who were too weak or sick to get up, and who were just shot in the back, cold-blooded. So to keep a life, she and her sister held each other up as they walked, because some days one or the other was too weak to walk, and so they supported each other. In the same way, we need to support each other in this walk, because sometimes it is dreary and it is tough, and, the sat and Satan is always trying to take pot shots at us. So we do need that support. It is time for us to dedicate our lives, to live that sanctified life, and the time is now. Lot's wife, she had knowledge of God. Abraham, the faithful Abraham, whom God declared as a friend. Remember, how was it that Lot was saved? Because God said, Abraham is my friend, and I will not hide anything from him. I'm not going to hide the fact that I'm going, to I'm going to destroy Sodom from him because Abraham is my friend. And because of that, uh, Lot's wife had the experience, the exposure of being with someone like Abraham, of living in his, within his household, under his protection. She was married to the righteous Lot, who remained righteous right to the end. She must have seen firsthand the blessings and favor that everyone had. Her husband prospered. With her husband prospering, she prospered too because she was part of his household. Can you imagine entertaining angels? She entertained two angels in her home. She feasted with them. She heard the warnings. She saw firsthand the supernatural judgment of God. That was a forewarning for her. When the men were blinded, that was God's judgment on those men pronounced by the angels, she knew what God's judgment was about. She was led out of Sodom by hand. She did not have to go on her own. Someone held her hand and said, come, we're getting out of here. But what happened to her? She died. She was turned into a pillar of salt. She lived as she died, godless and unbelieving. There are far too many Christians who, in flirting and, and courting with danger, end up living godless lives. There are far too many people who fill the pews in churches, but then when, when they walk out of the church, that's the end of it. It's back to business as usual. And Jesus has warned us at the very start, as in the days of Noah, as in the days of Lot, it's business as usual. Eating, drinking, getting married, right? Just as it's happening here today in the world, it's business as usual. None of us are feeling any kind of impact 
about the impending coming of the Son of Man. And yet, Jesus has said, remember Lot's wife. So it is not about living a good life. It's not about filling uh, pews in churches. It's not about saying the right things. You know, I constantly, uh, in my prayers um, and my morning devotion, I, I constantly thank God for the fact that I've grown up in a Christian home. My parents, my uh, my parents' uh, siblings and, and their children, uh, my grandparents, my great-grandparents were all Christians. So I had that blessing, I had that benefit. And that is exactly what it is. It is a blessing. It is a benefit. And I value it. But that is not all. My life has to be sanctified. My life has to be dedicated to God. My life has to be totally committed. And it ha I have to have that. I have to have a personal relationship with God. And so do each one of us here. Also, the problem with her is that her heart had been caught up with Sodom. And even though her body left, it was her heart and her mind that took her back to Sodom. We are warned about the lukewarm church of Laodicea, that Jesus said he was going to spit out. This is the church we're talking about. This is not the secular world. This is not non-Christians we're talking about. Jesus was talking about believers, about Christians, whom he said, I want nothing to do with you at the end of the day. These people are not going to be um, part of the bride of Christ. They will not be taken back. They will not be able to be present at the marriage feast because Jesus has spit them out. What about us? Are we going to be there? I have to admit that, you know, in what, when I was initially, like uh, early days, you know, some years back, reading the story of Lot's wife, I have to confess, I thought God was a little bit harsh, lah. you know? She only turned her head once, you know? It's not like she ran back, it's not like she pulled out of the angel's hand, who, the angel was holding her hand, you know? Pulled out her hand and ran back to Sodom to, for whatever purpose. She just looked back. I mean, you imagine, if someone says, your house is on fire, what do you do? You wake up your family, get out of the house, run down the road, and then you'll turn back and look back at your house and see, you know, how much am I going to be losing? It's a small thing and it's something very almost natural, but that's exactly it. What am I losing? That is what will be in your mind. And I would like to suggest that that is exactly what was in her mind. Not, what am I going towards? I'm going towards my God, but what am I leaving behind? Um, some writers have suggested, you know, this was the mother's heart. You know, uh, if you go back to the story of Lot in Genesis, um, it says that Lot spoke to his sons-in-law. That suggests that he had at least two married daughters. And when we read about who left Sodom, uh, we read about the fact that it's Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. Must be the two unmarried daughters who are living under his roof, which means they have left behind two daughters. So some writers suggest that it is the mother's heart, you know, um, thinking about the daughters who are being left behind. But what God requires of us is complete and total obedience, complete and total faith. We have to leave. Whatever he says to leave behind, we have to leave behind. She made a small error. She was warned not to look back three words, which even a five-year-old knows and understands. She looked back. She shouldn't have, but she did. And the consequence was fatal. That slight turn of head resulted in instant death. It was an act of rebellion. And the Bible is very clear. For the wages of sin is death. There's no salvation after that. Salvation is now. Now is the time to repent. Now is the time to ask for forgiveness. Now is the time for us to come out of our Sodom, leave it all behind, 
and cast eyes firmly upon the cross of Christ. Because that is where our salvation is, and that is all that must matter. Do you remember your first love? It was just a slight turn of head, but it spoke of her unbelief, her lack of faith. And we know that in Hebrews, without faith, it is impossible. It is impossible to please God. He wants complete and total trust and faith in Him. You know, it was disbelief. When, when we read the story of, Sod, of uh, Lot, we read that as they entered Zoar, before destruction fell upon Sodom, the sun was risen on the earth. It was a beautiful day, not a cloud in the sky, bright blue skies, a great day to go to the beach, a great day for a picnic. This is not a day for doom and gloom. If you watch the you know, American movies and all that, when something, destruction is going to happen, dark clouds roll in, there's thunder, there's lightning. That is an ominous day. That is what a day of destruction looks like. Not a bright blue day when the sun is shining. Lot's wife did not believe in the destruction. She did not believe that God meant what he said, that he was going to destroy the city because these people had displeased him. They were depraved. And so she looked back. And despite receiving the warnings, despite knowing God, despite seeing God's judgment on the men of Sodom the night before, it was just so close. She left her heart in Sodom and she looked back. What is the cost of discipleship? Jesus says in Luke 9, 57 to 62, I'm not going to read all of it, but very clearly from this, when Jesus calls us to follow him, when God says, come, get out of your Sodom, don't look back. If you do, you are not fit for his kingdom. So we need to believe in God. We need to have the faith that Lot's wife did not have, but the faith that Abraham had. And we need to believe him that when he says, you are sinless, when he says, you are my righteousness, we need to believe that we are. I'm no more the alcoholic I, was, I once was. I am now a person who likes alcohol a little too much and I need to do something about it. I'm no longer an angry person. I'm now someone who has an issue. I lack patience. And now I need to pray and ask God for greater patience and more and more patience. I'm not someone who has an unforgiving heart. I'm someone who needs to ask God to repent and ask God to soften my heart and to help me see other people as he sees them, including those who hurt me. I'm no longer a murderer. I've been saved. Just like the thief on the cross whom Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. He says that to each one of us. But do we believe it? Or are we like the other thief, mocking him and saying, no way? You, if indeed you are the son of God, come down and save us as well. It was only in dying that Jesus saved us. So let us cling firmly to the truth that is in the Bible. It was just a slight turn off her head, but it showed where her heart actually was. And very often, the reason why we don't move forward, very often the reason why we keep looking back, is because really, we are comfortable with the person we were. Really, we don't want to leave our comfort zone. If we have to change who we are, we never know where we're going to end up. And that's scary. That's terrifying. At least with whatever sin it is that I have, at least I know where I sit, you know, in this world. And that is why we're not willing to leave it behind. That is why we always want to carry it. You know, I remember when I was little, uh, and we, uh, my mom used to make us do uh, morning prayers as a family uh, w with her and my sister. And um, she will always say, you know, I don't understand you. You pray for certain things. So we had to pray, you know, in turn. You pray for certain things. You pray that you become obedient. You know, you say sorry to God for something wrong that you did. I didn't do my homework or whatever. Or I, you know, 
uh, fought with my sister, please forgive me, Lord. And then you leave all that at the cross, and then you pick it up and carry it back with you. And that is what all of us do. We go to God with our problems, our struggles, our anxieties. We kneel at the cross and we say, please help us and take all this away. And then we pick it up and walk off. We don't leave it at the cross. We don't believe that God is going to handle it. God is going to deal with it, not my problem anymore. We need to have that faith that Lot's wife did not have. That when God says, you are a new creation, he has become a good work in you which will be perfect only when he comes. Until then, we are a work in progress, but we're getting better. The Holy Spirit that is in you is cleaning out the cobwebs of your heart. The Holy Spirit that is in you is uh, doing some major spring cleaning and putting some beautiful flowers and creating some nice uh, smelling candles. But what do we do? We go out and instead of wiping our feet outside before walking in, we come in with our muddy boots and trample all over the clean floor. And we bring the dirt right back in. And the Holy Spirit has to start cleaning again. That is our problem. We need to learn to leave it all outside the door and come in with clean feet. So that the cleaning is easier and better for the Holy Spirit. Lot's wife tarried. The, the verse in the Bible in, in, in um, Genesis 19 says... She looked back from behind her husband. She looked back from behind Lot and was turned into a pillar of salt. We know that Lot tarried, but once out of the city and once having negotiated with uh, the angels that he was not going to the mountains, but he was going to Zohar, he proceeded onward, as did the daughters. But the fact that she looked back from behind Lot suggests that she was lagging behind him. She was dragging her feet, getting out of Sodom, even though the angels had her by her hand. And it suggests that she tarried because really she wanted to be in Sodom. Really, she did not want to leave. She was happy and comfortable with the you know, fineries and the, the culture of Sodom. She left because of what she knew. She understood exactly what the angel said. But she longed for the plains. She longed for the ease of Sodom. We too have received the same kind of information and warning. Time and time again, God calls us out. Will we move with urgency or will we tarry? It was a small mistake. Slight turn of head. But it spoke of her double-mindedness. It spoke of her deceitful heart. And the Bible talks about the fact that we are double-minded. We have deceitful hearts. And we are told to cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Because, you know, uh, it's the first part that is James. The rest is mine. Because we are schizophrenic. We can't make our minds up. You know, our mind is an amazing... The mind and the brain is amazing. It's a powerful entity, the mind. The mind can do an amazing amount of mental gymnastics, rationalization, reasoning, to bring it in line with our hearts, to bring it in line with what we long for, which is against the will of God. So if you long for something, your brain will tell you and your mind will tell you how it's actually okay, just as when God said, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what did the devil do? He entered Eve's mind and he said, surely not. Surely God didn't mean that. And Eve was like, yeah, actually, and that was the sin. It was the mind. And she had always longed for to eat the tree, from, uh, to eat the fruit from that tree. They had longed for it. They were circling it. It was there. It was the one thing we cannot touch. And they were okay with that until Satan said, come on lah, you can try. Nothing's going to happen. God didn't mean it. God didn't mean that he was going to destroy, destroy Sodom. 
there may be a few flashes of lightning, one or two houses may go up in smoke. But the whole city? Seriously? No way. God was not serious about it. God is not serious about the fact that he wants our hearts and minds to be completely in line with his will. He wants us to submit wholly and totally to his will. He is dead serious about that. And I mean dead serious, pun on that word. So, what are we supposed to do? We are supposed to keep our hearts with diligence. For out of it spring the issues of life. And out of it not only spring the issues of life, but the absence of life, of death. It was the slight turn of head that caused her instant death. There was no time for her to think. There was no time for her to come to realization. There was no time for her to pray, to repent. Just like that. Slight turn of head and she was gone. Made into a pillar of salt. And it is amazing for me that God chose to turn her into a pillar of salt rather than a pillar of rock. Uh, clearly, in that area, it was, uh, it's a very salty area. But also, we are called to be the salt of the earth. But too much salt can kill. And having been called to be the salt of the earth, here was a memorial. A person who was not the salt of the earth. She had sold her heart to Sodom. She was not making any difference in this world. And so she was struck down. In instructing her not to look back, God was saying to her, leave your past. Don't long for it. Don't think about the past. When you think about the past, you will want to return to it. You will want to return to the person that you were. It was an easy, comfortable, hedonistic life. Leave that behind. Leave behind your sinful nature. God wanted her out of Sodom. He wanted her to leave her sinful nature once and for all, to come back to the mountains, to come back to the hills, and to live a sanctified life, to live the sanctified life she had been, uh, she had been called into. And that is what God is saying to us. He's saying to each one of us over and over again, don't look back to who you were. Come. He reaches out his hand to us and he says, come with me. Come to me. I am your God who rescues you. I am the God who gave you salvation through Christ's death on the cross. Don't look back to the things of the past. For God, they are forgotten. He has cleaned us. We are cleansed once and for all through the death of Jesus Christ. God has called us out to be the pure, sanctified, righteous people. So my brothers and sisters, come, let us not. This is who we are. I come back to my first slide. Let us remember we are the new creation. So come, let us not be inattentive about God's second coming, Christ's second coming. Let us not be lukewarm Christians like the church of Laodicea. Let us live a life and walk as sons and daughters of the living God. Let us not be afraid of the mountains and to turn away from the plains of this world, the plains of Sodom. Let us not deceive ourselves that we can straddle this world and yet live and love and obey God at the same time. You cannot. You cannot serve two masters. Most importantly, having made the decision to live for God, to be faithful to God. Have you made the decision? Have you made the commitment to let go of the person that you once were before you accepted Christ? Have you made a decision and a commitment to turn away and to not look back? We are a new creation. We are the righteousness of God. By leaving our heart in our Sodom, we will not be able to move back. So come, let us rededicate our lives. Let us re-give our lives to God. Let us make Him our first love and turn to the hills from whence our help comes. If